Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. First, I would like to thank all of the people who have come out to participate in what we call this virtual walk to feed the hungry. Originally, we were planning to hold a, an actual physical walk to feed the hungry in New Jersey, just as every year, usually in the autumn, in New York City and in other cities in the, around the United States, we hold an actual walk to feed the hungry in which many people from different centers and temples or just individuals join together for on a very joyous occasion, usually walking three miles, four miles, five miles, and contributing financially to generate funds to support the projects of Buddhist global relief. And so, especially through the, it, on the initiative of Debbie Steinkuller, we were planning to hold a actual walk to feed the hungry in New Jersey this spring on March 31st. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately for many reasons, but because of the coronavirus, we're not able to hold the physical, the actual walk. And so instead, we came up with the idea of holding a virtual walk. That is, people can hold, the centers and temples can hold retreats or programs of various length of time, or individuals can do their own meditation, chanting, devotional practice at home, or they can take a walk through their neighborhood. And then on the basis of those activities, they can contribute donations to support the work of Buddhist Global Relief. So all of these methods really, even though the methods might differ from place to place, but they all have the same aim, which is to help generate the funds that will empower Buddhist Global Relief to continue its projects through the next fiscal year. And what underlies all of these projects, which I'll speak about in a little while, is a quality that I call conscientious compassion. And this quality of conscientious compassion, this I call, I would regard as the underlying pillar that supports all of the work of Buddhist global relief. So what is meant to, what do I mean by conscientious compassion? I say that this kind of compassion is different from the more passive type of compassion that just remains quietly bearing witness to the suffering of others and sending benevolent wishes out for the good of others. Of course, even that passive, quiet, contemplative compassion in various ways can be contributing to promote the good of others by motivating us to engage in action and by changing the vibrations of our society and the world in which we live. But conscientious compassion is a deliberately, intentionally active compassion which merges altruistic intentions with a deliberate, and enduring commitment to action, action guided by moral vision and by the ideal of a more just, harmonious, and peaceful world. And I believe that this type of conscientious compassion is what is urgently needed in this time when we see un injustice being implemented at so many levels economically, socially, racially, politically. And we see contention, conflict, wars, militarism, and so forth, gaining the ascendancy in today's world. Conscientious compassion, the way I understand it, springs from the recognition that in an interdependent world, the fate of each one of us is tied to the fate of all of us. And so through compassion, we feel the suffering of others as our own. And then through the sense of conscience, 
the inner voice urging us to action, we come forth in a willingness to take personal responsibility for the well-being of others. In other words, to do something to transform, to visibly transform the conditions of their lives. And conscientious compassion is especially directed towards the least and the lowest among us, to the poor, to the vulnerable, to those who are usually the most powerless. And this type of compassion moves us to reach out to rescue them in the face of the calamities, the injustices, the indignities they have to face often on a daily basis. The violation of war, poverty, exploitation, discriminations based on race, ethnicity, or religion, oppression by autocratic regimes, or by greedy, unscrupulous corporations and business enterprises. So conscientious compassion to be effective must motivate us to look beyond the outer manifestations of this collective suffering and to look deeply into the causes of that suffering, causes that are often hidden out of you. And then motivated by this compassion, we must be ready to tackle their causes and to affirm the rights of all people to a life of at least material security, peace, and freedom. The way I see it, conscientious compassion arises from the merging together, from the union of two secondary values which come together and reinforce each other. One of these is a commitment to justice. The other is love, by which I mean a heartfelt concern, even dedication to the good of others. The sense of justice is grounded on the premise that every human being possesses inherent dignity and inviolable worth that must be respected by everyone else and be affirmed by the institutions that express our common will. Out of this recognition of intrinsic worth comes the understanding that all people equally possess certain inalienable rights, rights that belong to them simply because they're human beings. Whether the color of their skin be white, black, or brown, whether they're male or female, whether they live in the US, Europe, Asia, Africa, or anyone anywhere else, that doesn't matter. What is essential is that each person as a human being is endowed with an inherent value that cannot be diminished, compromised, or denied. When we accept justice as a guiding ideal, this motivates us to stand up against injustice, to oppose policies, programs, institutions, social forces, ideas, beliefs that threaten to deprive people of the rights and securities that they should enjoy, the rights and security that inherently belong to them. And so this commitment to justice inspires a willingness to resist injustice and to stand up against those who perpetrate injustice, no matter how powerful, wealthy, and influential they might be. We resist those injustices in the recognition that the call of justice is more compelling than our own natural tendency to complacency, compliance, and submission. So people just 
often remain immersed in their own private concerns or in the concerns of the small groups to which they belong. But when we are motivated by the sense of justice, the foundation of conscientious compassion, we break out from the narrow shell of our own private interests. We look beyond the concerns of the groups with which we identify, and we look at humanity and even all sentient beings as a whole. And we resist the constrictions placed on their rights, the violations of their dignity, because we have the sense that there is a transcendent imperative, an imperative that lies beyond merely human fabrication, that tells us the good must prevail and we must become agents of the good. We must recognize and work in the confidence that in the long run and in the deepest sense, the triumph of justice is beneficial to everyone, even to the oppressors. The call to justice, the way I see it, operates at two levels. The first level is to ensure that people's material needs are met. And so this means that we work to ensure that people can gain access to the material requirements of a fulfilling life, above all to nutritious food, clean water, a safe home, sanitation, and a healthy natural environment. And this also entails establishing the conditions for economic security, trying to ensure that people have the ability to work at fulfilling jobs, um, that they can earn a living to support themselves and their family, and that they will be protected against violence and social neglect and political oppression. So the first imperative of justice is to enable people to survive and to live healthy and secure lives. The second imperative takes us a step further and motivates us to ensure that people can flourish, that they can live abundantly, pursuing their aspirations, realizing their potentials, actualizing and bringing to fulfillment their unique talents and skills. And so when the struggle, when we help people overcome the struggle against everyday poverty, hunger, malnutrition, and so forth, then we are ready to work for them to step, to take the next step, <clears throat> to take the steps that are necessary to help them flourish. And the way I see it, and the way we try to achieve this through Buddhist Global Relief, through our projects, we believe that to help people realize their potentials at the most basic level, the key is education. Education draws out the potentials hidden deep in the minds of people, potentials that would otherwise remain untapped if they didn't have access to education. So it's education that nourishes the seeds buried deep within the mind, enabling those seeds to send down roots, to send up sprouts, and to bring forth the flowers and fruits of a fulfilling life. So education opens the doors to a fulfilling life a life of rich meaning and purpose. And education also enables one to become of benefit to one's wider networks of relationships, to benefit one's family, one's community, one's society, one's country, and even the world. In many traditional cultures, education is not treated as a universal right, but is considered a privilege, a privilege which is given to the rich or to the even at minimum to the middle class, but is not given to poor people. 
And between the genders, it's given to boys, but not to girls. Girls, it's believed their job is to become housewives and mothers, to look after the household and family, but not to try to realize any talents within themselves other than that of being a good housekeeper. However, we believe that in today's world, in every country, it's especially necessary that girls be given the full opportunity to reap the benefits of education. We recognize that girls have as much potential for a meaningful life as boys, and that as women, they can make just as valuable a contribution to their communities, science, uh, societies, and nations as men. And so to realize that aim, to unfold their potentials, they deserve to receive a full education. One of the examples of how this education project, or this ideal of giving girls education works through the projects supported by Buddhist Core Belief is a program that we've been supporting for many years in Cambodia. This program is called GATE, which we operate in partnership with another organization, US-based, but working in, Cam in Cambodia, called Lotus Outreach. The name of the program, GATE, is an acronym which stands for Girls Access to Education. The program provides rice support to the families of poor girls on condition that they allow their daughters to remain in school. If the family tries to compel the girl to drop out of school in order to work to support the family, they lose that rice support and other types of foodstuffs foodstuffs that are given to the family. So this motivates the family to keep the girls in school. And these girls are coming from the poorest level of Cambodian society. And almost all the girls who have entered the GATE program in high school complete their high school education. And of those who do so, many, at least 100, probably more, go on to college. And together with Lotus Outreach, we support another program, a kind of sequel to the GATE program. This is called Catalyst. And this supports girls who have qualified to enter university. So these are girls coming from the poorest stratum of Cambodian society. Often the fathers are missing. The mothers sometimes have to support three or four children in a little shack. And without the support, the sponsorship of GATE, the girls would never have continued in school. But now so many of these girls have completed high school, have gotten good jobs, or have even gone on to college and are now studying, and some have graduated college already, to become doctors, nurses, businesswomen, social workers, teachers, scientists. Um, accountants, and so forth. And so this is way that this program, grounded in the sense of justice, is helping to turn these girls into agents of change in their communities and in their country. Okay, so the first factor that enters into conscientious compassion is justice. The second factor integral to conscientious compassion is what I call love. And love, you know, looking at justice, we could say if we take justice alone in isolation, it has a rather harsh flavor to it. We have to follow the decree of justice, like it or not. But love is what softens the heart and which brings forth the urge to act on behalf of others straight from the heart. And so what is meant by love? 
here by love, I don't mean just a sentimental feeling, a kind of hunky-dunky feeling of goodwill towards others, a kind of snappy, happy feeling of goodwill towards others. But what I meant, I mean by love is a deep, heartfelt concern for the true well-being of others, a solid, persistent wish for others to be secure, to be happy, to achieve the good that they set for themselves, and to experience inner fulfillment. And this type of love, maybe initially it begins with a limited range of reference, but through development, through cultivation, it can be extended towards all human beings, the entire human family, based on a recognition of our common humanity. And the way I see it, this kind of love springs from the understanding that every person is a center of subjective experience, that every person is a distinct pole star of an entire world, a particular, even we could say a turning point of the universe. When we look at other people, First, we see them in terms of their faces and their physical bodies. And so we see the outer shell of the person. And then on top of this, we project onto the vis visible image of the person our own categories, concepts, and you know, ways of processing the visible data and fitting people into our neat little categorical schemes, schemes of categories, which are often colored by our own biases, preferences, and prejudices. But when we look deeply into another person, pierce beneath the skin, through, going through the physical body, we see that each person is a mind and a heart, a center of subjective experience. Every person is processing the world in their own way. I say the center of the universe. And when we recognize the subjective reality of other people, then we feel this deep urge, this need to protect them. And to protect each person is in a way to protect the entire world. And so from this recognition of subjectivity comes a sense of solidarity, the feeling of unity with others. And this sense of solidarity is rooted in the realization that every person, every human being shares with us the same essential nature, the same essential desire the recognition that every person wishes to live, not to die. Everyone wishes to be happy, not to suffer. Everyone has ideals and aspirations that they want to fulfill. And when one develops love based on the sense of solidarity, one endeavors to extend to everyone the same concern that one would naturally and spontaneously extend to one's own mother, father, brother, sister, son, or daughter. The desire to protect them from harm, to rescue them from suffering, and to establish the conditions for them to live happily and at peace. Okay, so when the commitment to justice comes together and merges with the spirit of love, what emerges from that union is conscientious compassion. Compassion that stems from a recognition of the hard and sometimes harsh demands of justice and from the warm wish grounded in love, the wish for others to flourish 
and realize their fullest potential. Conscientious compassion, I say, unites the highest moral vision of the great spiritual traditions, of all the great spiritual traditions, in a call for transformative action. And so if we follow the call of conscientious compassion, we can bring into being the kind of world for which we really are all aspiring, the world that will give us all the opportunity to live together in harmony and to flourish in harmony. And so by joining over this week, this virtual walk to feed the hungry, you are contributing in some way to fulfill this call of conscientious compassion. And I hope that by fulfilling this call of conscientious, conscientious compassion, you'll experience a deep sense of joy and fulfillment within yourself. And you'll also be able to contribute by assisting the work of Buddhist Global Relief to help make this world a better place for all of us. I thank you all again for participating in this virtual retreat. I thank especially the organizers who have been motivating people to join. And let me extend my blessings to everyone with these verses of, of blessing. Bhavatu Sabha Mangalang, Rakantu Sabha Devata, Sabha Buddhanu Bhavena, Sabha Dhammanu Bhavena, Sabha Sanganu Bhavena, Sada Soti Bhavantu Te. Thank you again.